you see the pitcher toss the ball, how he'd like to control the flight of that ball, its speed and the way it breaks and the curvature. But try as hard as he will, we all know that he really can't control the flight of the ball exactly the same in every try. There's an intrinsic variability in the way the ball approaches the batter. And in point of fact, as we all know, it's this intrinsic variability that, well, adds life and excitement to the game of baseball. But consider some other kinds of observations that we might make that have an intrinsic variability. Uh, for example, consider the uh, people who are attending this baseball game. There they all are. Do you think they all have the same weights? Or if we were to ask them how much money they had in their pockets, do you think they'd all have the same amount of money? Or do they all have the same hat sizes? Or think of something in a slightly more controlled environment, like someone packaging produce, such as we see here in the supermarket. Do you really think that there's a pound of peaches in each one of those cans? Or as far as that goes, is there a pound of coffee in every bag of coffee? Or every can of coffee? As we all know, the manufacturers attempt to get approximately a pound in each, or whatever the weight is in each one of these cartons without success. In an industrial environment, think of the tubes here in this electronic rig and the capacitors and the resistors. Think of these, uh, this collection of electronic tubes here. Do you, they were all manufactured in homogeneous conditions. They're all supposed to have the same operating characteristics, but you know and I know that they all live a different length of time and actually their characteristics are different from tube to tube. There's an intrinsic variability even in this controlled environment. But let's turn to a real scientific environment, a laboratory. And here we see uh, two uh, research scientists and one says to the other, <laughs> I sent two identical samples to the lab, and what do you think they said? And his cohort replies, ha, you can be sure uh, they did not agree. Now, we all know very, very well that there's an intrinsic variability natural to every data-taking process. And control, though you will, the environment surrounding the uh, data-taking, uh, you will find uh, repeated observations do not, in effect, agree with one another. There's an intrinsic variability in every data-taking operation. And in point of fact, that's what we're going to talk about in this lecture. We want you to get some appreciation of how observations distribute themselves and some of the characteristics of the inherent variability, if you will, of uh, numbers as we record them. Well, now, I want you to imagine that you're a production foreman. And every hour you go by your process and you take some sort of an observation and uh, you plot it on a control chart, let's say. And um, it's not important in this instance to uh, worry about uh, which of the um, uh, units the yields are measured in here. The yields might be percent of theoretical or percent uh, passable items, what have you. You put the units on yields that you please. But let's see what happens in the first hour of the 24-hour day. And you can see uh, our uh, foreman has recorded a yield of about 47. All right, in the second hour when he walks by, uh, let's see what he gets on the second hour. Aha, uh -huh, something about 60-odd, uh, 61 or so. And in the third hour, he plots uh, 52. And so throughout the day, every hour, he comes by and looks at the process. And by golly, just look at the way those observations vary, will you? You know, it's very profitable to plot data in such a time sequence because it gives us a feeling for the way in which the process trends, and certainly it highlights the uh, unusually high or unusually low observations. But I want to think of the aggregation of these uh, observations we see here. So I'm going to collapse that time axis out. So when I clap my hands, out will go the time axis. Isn't that fine? Look at that group of observations you see there now. There is a distribution of observations, and you can see how they're, they've piled up uh, in the area between uh, 50 and 60. There's a little tailing out around 70 and down in the mid-30s, but there is a distribution of observations. Now let's see what happens on Tuesday, the next set of 24 observations. Uh-huh. Not the same exact set of observations, to be sure, and yet when we look at them in the aggregate, these, there's a certain persistency in the way the observations are collecting. The tendency to pack in the mid-50s is still there, and they're still trailing off. Let's find out what happens on Wednesday. Variations on a theme. There are 24 observations there. They don't, are not exactly the same as they were before, but that tendency persists. Let's watch Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Uh-oh, Sunday. <laughs> well, very clearly, uh, either they don't work at this place on uh, Saturday and Sundays, or the production foreman doesn't work there at any rate. The important issue at uh, stake here is the fact that when we take small aggregates of observations, trying to observe something over and over again, we take them in small aggregates, we notice there's a persistency uh, that seems to characterize these aggregations. 
Now I'm going to take those 24 observations per day for the five days, and I'm going to aggregate them into a still a larger pile. And so we're going to see a dot diagram here made up of all uh, uh, five times 24 observations. And here we see it. And once again, uh, this tendency to group, to cluster uh, between 50 and 60 is still apparent. Uh, these are very real data, incidentally, and you'll notice a human characteristic which is breaking in upon us here. Human beings, bless them, have a tendency to round to nice even numbers like 50 and 60 and 55, and we see a bit of that uh, in our data. It's a great deal of detail actually uh, apparent in this dot diagram, but the general characteristics of clustering and so on are there. I'm going to replace this dot diagram with uh, what's called a bar chart or a histogram. And so we're going to make those dots disappear. We're going to, there. And we're going to replace the dots by uh, rectangles whose height is equal to the frequency of the number of observations. And the width of those particular rectangles, uh, the cell size, in this case, uh, runs in units of one. Over 50, you'll notice all observations that fell between 49 and a half and 50 and a half are included in that particular bar. Once again, there's a bit more detail in this particular histogram than we'd really like to have. So I'm going to aggregate those uh, uh, little rectangles and turn them into larger rectangles. So let's see what happens when we do that. R. Now, isn't that pretty? We're really getting an appreciation now of the honest-to-goodness nature of these observations when looked at in the aggregate. We see a distribution of observations that's slightly skewed over here to the... Um, uh, left-hand side, and uh, we can really uh, begin to uh, see uh, what's going on. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace uh, that diagram with an actual collection of blocks that I have here, uh, which is uh, approximately the same. And we see here a um, same blooming histogram. Now, there are the observations down the 30s, here are the mid-30s, the 40s, and so on up. And here is my histogram or bar chart of all the observations. This is called a frequency distribution. It shows me the frequency of the observations which I collected over that one week's period of time. Now, statisticians are not only interested in the frequency distribution, they're often interested in something called a cumulative frequency distribution. Now, as the name implies, it means something is going to be accumulated, and what I'm going to accumulate is the number of observations in each cell as I move from left to right. And so let's just play that game. What do you say? Here are the number of observations in the first cell. And then in the second cell, I'm going to place the number of observations in the first plus the number of observations in the second. And here comes the next cell. See that? Now I'm just going to keep piling them up, one on top of the other. And it gets higher and higher. This is the cumulative distribution that's coming along here. It ought to climb pretty rapidly for a while as I approach the, the high frequencies of the original distribution function. Here we go. Like an erector set here up and up. And then it ought to start sort of gradually dying out here. See, it's beginning to tend up. And here's the last cell aggregating. And there we have it, an R. There's a cumulative distribution function. You can see how the frequencies are accumulating as I move from left to right. And right here, how high do you think this particular bar turns out to be? It's 5 times 24. That's how many observations are in this final, in this final uh, classification, you see. The total number of observations has been accumulated from left to right. OK, now let's talk about a, another more industrial problem. Uh, I want you to imagine 3,000 items that have been exposed to an environmental test. And uh, the thing we're measuring is the, uh, the life of the item, how long it took the item before it failed, if you will. And we see here on our board a uh, once again, a frequency diagram. Uh, we see life in hours of these items. Uh, some items died in their infancy down the area of 25 hours. Uh, some of the other items uh, didn't die until way up here around 700 hours. And of course, the, uh, where are we now? About 175 hours here. Um, many items died about that point in time. In fact, something over 300. Now, the and trouble with a frequency diagram is this number down here, 3,000. If I were to have taken another collection of 3,000 items, I wouldn't have gotten exactly the same histogram. And in point of fact, if I had taken 300 items, I would have gotten a reasonable appreciation for this histogram, to be sure. But the important thing is, as I talk about different histograms based on different number of observations, I have to keep telling you how many observations make up the histogram. And that's a little awkward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this ordinate axis here, which is the frequency axis, by something called the relative frequency axis. Well, now it just disappeared, and watch it come back. Here, 
we see the relative frequency axis coming in. Now all I did was take the frequency, which is about 320 that time, and divide down by the total number of observations, and you'll notice I got something in excess of 10%. So the relative frequency of the observations in this cell, relative, if you will, to all the other cells, is just written by a reading over here on the ordinate axis. Now we're going to call the horizontal axis here Y to indicate the yields that we're, going up, we're contending with. So let's even get some sort of mathematical expression for the nature of the relative frequencies. So we need some sort of symbolism. So what we're going to do, we're going to count up, let's consider this as the ith cell, shall we? Now count up the number of items in the ith cell and call that n sub i. If you were to divide n sub i down by capital N, you would have the frequency of the observations in the ith cell, and that's why we have that little f of i there. The frequency of the observations in the ith cell is given by n sub i divided down by n. Now, what are the characteristics of f of i? And this is, should be very clear to all of us. f of i must always be greater than or equal to zero. So I'm defining a mathematical function which can never take a negative value. Another interesting characteristic of the f of i's is simply that if I sum them all up over each one of the i's classifications, sum them all up, three guesses what happens. Well, the sum of all those observations uh, comes out and equals one. Now, suppose someone pops in and says, uh, hey, Stu, um, what's the probability that if I take an observation randomly from that distribution, what's the probability that I'll find an observation greater than or equal to 500? Now, how would we work such a problem? Well, the trick here would be to concern ourselves with observations in the cell marked 500 and all observations in the, on, in the following cells. And what we could do here, we could solve this problem two ways. That probability is given by taking the frequency here, 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 all the way out, taking the total of those frequencies and dividing down by 3,000. That's a long-winded and rather messy way of doing it. An easier way of doing it is just take the relative frequencies in each one of those cells and sum them up. It turns out the probability that an observation y randomly drawn from this group of observations will be greater than or equal to 500 is given by the sum of these relative frequencies. And we figured that out in this particular example. And the sum of those relative frequencies is equal to um, 0.12. The probability is about 1.12 that you will find such an observation. Now, another point I'd like to raise is this is, as I've mentioned before, a particular collection of 3,000 observations. And if I were to get another set of 3,000, I wouldn't get exactly that histogram. I'd get another histogram very similar to this one, to be sure. So I want you to think in terms of the conceptual frame of all the possible histograms we might imagine based on 3,000 observations. And if I were to do that, I could perhaps represent them all by a continuous probability density function. And so I'm going to throw a line, a continuous line, through uh, this particular uh, one here. R, isn't that pretty? Now, just I want you to think in terms of a, here are the y's being measured this way, and I'm going to call this mathematical line, this line, I'm going to give it a mathematical name. I'm going to call it f of y. And so let's think of the characteristics of the, um, of the quantity f of y, which in essence is a continuous distribution function. What are its characteristics? Well, as in the discrete case, or in the particular case, the f of y, this line, must always be above the horizontal axis. And another important characteristic of f of y is if we integrate f of y from minus infinity to plus infinity, or if you will, over the range for which the y's are valid, uh, y will find that the uh, area under that curve is remarkably equal to 1. In point of fact, we always make darn sure that when we define f of y as a density function, as a probability density function, we manage to dump in constants and so forth to guarantee that the expression f of y, when integrated, sure enough, will come out equal to 1.